Thank you for downloading this podcast from the Forum for Philosophy. Subscribe for weekly discussions of science, culture, politics and the arts from a philosophical perspective. The Forum is a non-profit organisation and our events are free and open to all. You can support our work via our website and Facebook page. Good evening, everyone. Communities commemorate some people and events in public. Memorials can become sites of fierce political contestation, as can the absence of memorials. How does remembering in public help frame a sense of group identity? Who and what should be remembered? Are there people and events that ought to be forgotten? When, if ever, should memorials be removed? Our panel are going to discuss past and present controversies around public memorialising, from Confederate monuments to the Roads Must Fall movement, from the fourth plinth in Trafalgar Square to Ground Zero in New York. I'm Sarah Fine from the Department of Philosophy at King's College London and fellow here at the Forum, and I'm delighted to introduce our distinguished panel for this evening. To my right, we have Michelle Codrington Rogers, who teaches citizenship at an Oxfordshire secondary school. Michelle's political awareness was already on display at the age of five when she was involved in an, an, in an organized walkout at school. That first strike was the first step on her path to her current role as an active trade unionist. She was the National Union of Students Black Students Officer and is currently the first black junior vice president of NASUWT, the Teachers Union, which represents 300,000 teachers across the UK. We have Margaret O'Callaghan, who is reader in history and politics in the School of History, Anthropology, Philosophy and Politics at Queen's University Belfast. Her interests are in Irish political thought, the politics of Irish literature, British high politics, modern Irish cultural and political history, and of course, the politics of commemoration and memory on which she has published widely. To my left, we have Rahul Rao, who is senior lecturer in politics at the Department of Politics and International Studies at SOAS. His research interests are in, the international, are in international relations theory, the international relations of South Asia, comparative political thought, and gender and sexuality. And his first book, Third World Protest, Between Home and the World, explored the relationship between cosmopolitanism and nationalism in post-colonial protest. Welcome. So the first question that the panel are going to discuss this evening is what are public memorials and what or who are they for? And we're going to start with you, Rahul. Thank you. Um, what are public memorials? On the face of it, they are memorials in public, in public space. Um, why are they built? Very often they're built to commemorate something, to remember something. Uh, sometimes they're built to celebrate or glorify somebody. Uh, they may be built also to represent a community. And this is often the capacity in which they tend to be quite controversial. Uh, does a particular monument in public space in fact represent the community that lives or gathers around it um, in an everyday sense? Uh, and sometimes memorials in public space are not actually public in the sense of being attached to the state or the community at all. They just happen to be outside, but they're quite private. Uh, this is often true of memorials that are uh, maybe dedicated to philanthropists um, that are built as a legacy or, or, or a way of leaving behind a legacy of immortalizing somebody um, who's given a lot of money to an institution, for example. Those kinds of memorials aren't necessarily public at all, um, but they, they are outside. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Margaret, would you like to come in on this? Um, I suppose memorials, in, in recent discussion, uh, we think about statues or we think of actual objects, but even the blue plaques we see all over buildings in London are, to a degree, memorials uh, to the individuals who are remembered. Um, 
Different people erect different memorials in different contexts. I mean, that's a very obvious statement on the one hand, but public space is where I suppose most of what we think of as political monuments are situated. So if you look around the city of London, I suppose, you'll see the history of Britain's empire inscribed in a whole variety of ways uh, through individuals who are celebrated or commemorated. Um, Memorials also have a fashion, if you like. They have a period. Uh, At the moment, we've been looking at the memorialising of World War I, Uh, When we want to memorialise something in the present, we tend not to go for representative statues. Uh, If you look at the whole success, for example, of the phenomenon of the red poppies and how they were transformed uh, for this particular First World War commemoration, you'll see that representation, which is a complex term, has shifted its function in terms of memorialising. Um, I suppose the other thing you'd have to say is that I live in Belfast and their commemoration plays different kinds of roles because in a society that's post-conflict, you have former participants erecting monuments to their own defeated comrades. Because we don't have any agreement or consensus about what happened in the recent past, memorialising, commemorating, erecting informal monuments, constructing um, murals all over the city, marking and territorialising an area through memorialising is a very live issue. Um, Though I live in Belfast, I'm from Dublin, and that is a society where I suppose you could say the public architecture of what is commemorated in the public space of the society has altered since Ireland became independent. And I suppose the other thing about one of the roles commemoration or memorialising has played in the past is to polit- it's always political. It's, you know, sometimes to galvanise people. It's, it, it's a negotiation between the politics of the present and a past you want to remember. So it's a very complex political process, I think, memorialising. Thank you. Michelle? I think the reason why I'm here is to kind of show that memorialization doesn't just happen with buildings and the reason how I end up on these panels is because of my name I'm a Codrington from the Caribbean um, and the name Codrington is synonymous in, I'm from Oxford especially in Oxford with the Codrington Library which is kind of a memorial to a slave owner who contributed money to have something put in his name. And as a teacher, one of the things that I I find fascinating is that people talk about buildings, and one of the first things that slave owners did was they named the slaves after them. They branded the the slaves with their personal brand. They wanted to create a legacy based on their kind of, I guess, their ownership, which is something that is that carries on down through the line. And the reason I'm here is because I've got that name. Um, And that name has different connotations, you know, beyond the building. Um, I've grown up in Oxford. I'm an Oxford girl. I'm I'm working class Oxford. I teach working class children in Oxford. And yet I've never once been into into the Codrington Library. And the Codrington Library is holds a different legacy for, I guess, the black Codringtons as opposed to the white Codringtons. And one of the stories that I tell is a story about my father. I remember distinctly being about 10 years old, my father picking up the phone and kind of saying um, hello and kind of started swearing down the phone and hanging up. And it was was somebody from the Codrington Library had contacted us, because they've obviously found us in a, in a phone book, and asked us to donate towards the upkeep <laughs> of the library. So when we talk about memorial memorialization and legacy, we have to remember that legacies and memorials mean something to different people. And for me, the the Codrington name is something that I carry because it's about a memorial to my ancestors who were the subject to an attempt to tell a completely different story. We are erased from history apart from the fact that our names and our numbers are in a ledger. My grandmother remembers um, dusting off the, the slave ledgers. And so we are just numbers. And so 
my driver is to kind of re reframe that story because otherwise I my family become owners uh, owned we are a subject to being owned um, and so therefore legacy is something that can be shaped by the people who have the power but it can also be regrasped and reframed and so when we talk about memorialization it's that idea of what shape does it take is it a building, is it a plaque, or is it the legacy that some people carry in their name, but also in the trauma of their DNA? And for me, that's where that, the discussion needs to be wider to talk about what memorial actually means. Okay, thank you so much to the panel for getting us off to this great step. So what we're going to do next is, is think about the question, who and what should be remembered in public? And are there people and events that ought to be forgotten. So we'll discuss that among the panel, and then I'll open to you, the audience, to come in and ask some questions. So, Margaret, who and what should be remembered in public? It's an extremely difficult question, and one to which there are, uh, you know, my answer is by definition, I think, political. Uh, what should be remembered? Uh, Things that are memorialized in public don't tend to be things that we have decided as a group ought to be memorialized in public. They are, uh, they are objects usually put in place by some kind of um, prevailing power or structure of power at a particular given time. So you're kind of asking me as if I were a superior being, what would I like to? Uh, I, I mean, I suppose... We have a human notion that bearing witness is important and that we ought to bear witness to things in the past that deserve to be borne witness to. So, in other words, what Michelle has just been sp speaking about is a whole historical experience of her ancestors, of the erasure of their identity to some degree, uh, the strange juxtaposition of that with the library. So, I mean, I suppose you could say it's an imaginative challenge to think about a way in which what she's speaking about could be memorialised. Uh, I mean, we, we all talk about what we should remember, but of course remembering and forgetting are two sides of the same coin, and we choose to forget things that aren't popular in the present. So, so in other words, remembrance, memorialising, these are all about our current political concerns. It is because we are a generation who are more aware of the legacy of slavery that we're having this conversation now. Eighty years ago, the whole thing about the Coddington Library would have been completely unproblematic. It was the pervasive set of assumptions that most people in the society had. I mean, people... Uh, you know, so, so clearly, uh, most people would agree that we need to maintain memorialisation and commemoration of the Holocaust, for example. Um, but, the, 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 you know, it's, it's not up to me to decide... <laughs> It's not up to me to decide what should be commemorated or memorialised, but I think we should be aware that what gets remembered is a product of certain kind of contestation, that it is highly political, that it operates within forms already agreed. Like, for example, if you look at First World War commemorations here, a kind of template for them was always set, sort of set up by the Boer War. You know, what's being commemorated in the present? I mean, I lived in Cambridge uh, a little while ago, uh, a couple of decades ago to be accurate, and very few people wore poppies. Old chaps, you know, would sell their poppies or British Legion people would sell them. But I mean, they are memorials of a kind. They are very vivid statements of a kind of memorialization of a past in the present. So I'm curious about questions like, why is the poppy so extraordinarily pervasive in contemporary Britain when hardly anyone wore one 25 years ago? And those questions, I think, are interesting. And I think the symbols we elevate, the kinds of things we want to commemorate, tell us quite a lot about our politics in the present. It's just complex to read them. Mm. Thank you. Michelle? 
Well, as a teacher, one of the, the, con the conflicts we have in education is that we're constantly being, uh, telling our students we learn about our past, we don't make the mistakes of the, of the, of in the future and in the present. And we, we keep holding on to this narrative, and yet we still see an increase in racism and sexism and homophobia. We're seeing discrimination in between community groups, and it tends to be one debate, one discussion kind of accelerates that those divisions. And so if we're talking about using memorials to kind of keep those conversations going, then actually it's important that we do keep the the symbols there to keep the conversation going to help us remember the past. Um, the conflict that I have personally is whether or not we should be removing, um, removing these symbols or whether or not we should be reappropriating these symbols. And I'm very much of the line that we should be reappropriating them and we should be expanding the conversation that existed around them when they were created, but also what do they mean to us today? Um, our conversations are shifting and changing every single day. I, a conversation I have with my year nines um, is very different to a conversation I had with their predecessors 10 years ago because our, our social consciousness awakens and becomes um, more, I like to think it becomes more inclusive in the language that we use. But the memorial, the idea of memorial should be there not necessarily for us to, to hold up on on a pedestal to never be criticised, actually, the more information we get, the more that our, our vocabulary expands, the more we should revisit these and we should be reframing them in the dialogue and in the conversations of today. So when, it, when we're talking about whether or not they should be um, remembered and who should, who should be remembering them, actually, it's about giving an opportunity to opening up that conversation so those who are forgotten or those whose voices weren't included in, at the start of this, their, that process, I've actually given an opportunity, opportunity to rebalance it. And just an example I would give is with the Codrington Library as part of this. The reason why I got involved in, it was because of the Rose Must Fall um, campaign in Oxford, um, which was linked to the one in, um, in Africa and linking to um, the kind of campaigns that were happening in America and on the campuses as well. Mm -hmm. And I got involved because my name being Codrington, um, um, was kind of picked up in a newspaper, in an article, and the students contacted me to say, would you, would you um, speak? And it was from that point, as somebody who'd never, as I, and I say to today, I never, have never been in the library, and still haven't to this day been in the library, have attended conferences there and spoke at panels next door to the library, but can't physically bring myself to go in there. As part of that conversation, they've now got a plaque outside the Codrington Library, which my, me and my family were able to contribute to the language to basically say this library also commemorates the... the the um, income that was generated off of the backs of slavery, off of people who were not paid for their service. And so it's about adding to, from my, from my perspective, mm. and uh, expanding that conversation. Thank you so much. Oh. Um, I think if you asked the question, who or what should be remembered, everyone has a different answer. And I think that requires us maybe to reframe the question to why are we remembering the things that we are? And that's usually because something in the past speaks to us in the present um, in a certain way. Um, I've been reading Saidia Hartman quite a lot recently, and uh, she makes this argument about slavery. She says, if we are talking about slavery today, which we aren't always as much as we should be, but to the extent that we are, it isn't necessarily because uh, of some kind of pathological attachment to the past. It's because we live in a present in which black lives still do not matter. And that makes it imperative to think about the continuities, the question of what has not changed, as much as what has changed, because some things have changed. Um, so, so that, it, if I were to answer the question in a more general way, I would say that because history is usually the record of victors, there is a particular obligation to remember those who were vanquished, uh, the subaltern, the, the ones who left no trace. Um, and I think there is a hunger for that kind of representation, uh, for the kinds of stories and genealogies that tell people where they came from, but also why the societies they live in today look the way they do today. I think those are the kinds of impulses that are um, 
underneath or generating this hunger for representation um, and, um, a, a, and voice, but also redistribution. And maybe we can have a conversation about the extent to which some of these demands are also about uh, a demand for the redistribution of material resources, um, in addition to being visually or physically represented in public space. But you also asked the really interesting question of what, whether anything should be forgotten. And I think that's, that's fascinating and not obvious to me. Um, the historian Faisal Devji wrote a piece in the, in the Hindu, which is a daily newspaper in India, uh, a few years ago, in which, and this was on the occasion of Independence Day in India and Pakistan, which, as you know, is also the anniversary of partition. And the argument he makes there was that um, there's a lot of remembering these days of partition and not enough of independence. Uh, he suggests also that maybe uh, we need to begin to forget some things because too much remembering, particularly in relation to traumatic events where both sides hold on to a narrative of uh, violation and grievance and betrayal, all of which is probably true, uh, might also be sublimated into a desire for revenge, which I think we see playing out in, especially in South Asia in the context of communal violence. Mostly it has to be said from a Hindu majoritarian side against minorities and members of subordinate castes. So he does talk about forgetting as being part of the process of reconciliation. To be clear, I'm not sure what I think about this. Um, I... I think I have a more psychoanalytic view of this, which is that forgetting almost always entails some degree of repression, which will then manifest itself in a kind of traumatic symptom and perhaps lead to repetition. So I have to say I'm more on the side of remembering what's and all uh, rather than forgetting. Um, well, I suppose maybe we don't choose what we forget. Mm. It's the wider power within which we operate that determines over time what's forgotten and what's remembered. Mm. So we're talking almost like we choose this, but if we look at um, w memorials, certainly up to now, uh, they're usually about entrenching a sense of identity of either individuals or groups. They're usually representations of power or the other kinds of, the kind of monuments you're talking about that could be enabling or opening up or a different thing. But even subaltern memorials are often ways of displaying victimhood in the present. So there's um, a critic called Edna Long. He says, it's always about my memories, not yours. So, so in the present, people are constantly seeking to galvanize their version of the past for the purpose of commemorating that in the present. And that's a kind of real political fact. It's not a very, you know, so, so I think we have two things to talk about, what ought to be the case and what appears to be the case, which is that people are constantly pushing for ways in which their interests can be advanced. Now, we can make moral decisions about what interests we deem to be uh, moral. You know, we can make those judgments. But uh, I think we have to recognize that the political is uh, often not the domain of um, just the good. It's mm. often the domain of, you know, the will to power, the desire for... Uh, the best representation of one's own interests. And for most of history over many centuries and in many cultures, public memorialising, whatever form it's taken, has usually, I think, been about the interests of the dominant groups. Mm. I think that's where it's important to use the word trauma. And I think that is something that it's not a choice about whether or not you... Uh, you you're remembering it because mm -hmm. it's there. Um, I know within the black community in particular, um, it's always trying to make sure that we are represented because we are just represented by our absence constantly. Um, and there does seem to, it sometimes does feel like the only way we are, are we have got a space in conversations is by our victimhood as opposed to our... That's kind of a brilliant point, I suppose, because for a lot of people, the mm. Codrington Library is just something they don't even see anymore. <laughs> it's in, you know, it's just a thing. It happens to be called the Codrington. But, you know, what you're trying to do is to open up 
the actual truth about the fact that we do live in a world of actual, I mean, they're real symbols uh, mm -hmm. and metaphors for historical experience. So, so it's, you know, it, 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 yeah, it's opening. I think your image of opening up something that's closed is fascinating. And I think the fact that people find other ways to kind of get this, get their voices and get their side of the story out. In education, we don't talk about empire. We, if we do, it's the Michael Govian version. It's the, oh, look at how Britain went and saved all these people from themselves. Um, and as teachers, we struggle. I know that myself and my colleagues uh -huh. struggle with that because especially those of us who are more conscious and aware of the fact that the empire did have repercussions still to today that we are feeling. And it's not something that, we can, that can be forgotten. But the fact that it's being, to use a phrase, whitewashed from our education system means there's already an attempt to forget. There's already an attempt to reframe. And yet the trauma is still there. And yet we see how prevalent the need is for that attempt to rebalance the, the conversation. And it happens in many different ways, sometimes that are kind of so under the radar that are, and in pop culture. So one of the things, you know, Black Panther, we talk about Black Panther, but yes, it was a Disney, yes, it was linked to Marvel. Um, however, it gave an opportunity for people who are still dealing with the trauma of the different forms of colonialization, of the repercussions of that, to try and pull some sense back. Um, it... it you just have to say Black Panther and you have to talk about Wakanda and within, you know, within the black community you see a sense of pride kind of come from something that was fictional but it presents this opportunity of what could have been and that's where it's an attempt to rebalance and reshift that conversation as much as it might be pop culture, as much as it might be Disney, um, it has a meaning to, some, to other people and it is something that will be remembered maybe not necessarily for the same reasons as what the popular reasons are. Okay, fascinating. Thank you. So in the final part, we're going to talk about the question of when, if ever, memorials should be removed. But before we do that, it would be great to hear from you. So um, do raise your hands if you have questions. And there's a roving mic, so don't start speaking until it gets to you. And I'm going to take a few in one go. So we'll start here at the front, and then we'll take this one here, yeah, the person with the glasses, and then bef behind, the person with the blue jumper. Okay, start here. Thank you. Um, good evening. Um, so my question was uh, about, I mean, just some uh, context to the question. So I, I was actually uh, curious to know about uh, what you thought about the construction of the Statue of Unity in India, which was this uh, massive structure built uh, of uh, a freedom fighter uh, back during India's struggle for independence, and which is around 200 meters tall, and like a lot of money went to it, into it. And uh, there was basically like a lot of um, conflict with like the people they had to displace through it um, because it, it was a massive project. So uh, what I really wanted to know was... Um, how much of an input do you think, uh, like how, how, how much of an input for, some, for a project that's that big in size would people, should people have a say in because um, it, it caused a lot of problems and it still is because like everyone's pretty still, like pretty much still angry about it. So, um, and do you think uh, something like that would be possible like to get the people's vote into it because it is their life that is, that, that is being disrupted? Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, thank you very much. Um, my question is about um, multiple use of memorials, and particularly contemporary and past. I uh, was very interested in Ms. Codrington Rogers' point about the legacy of names, because I do have an acquaintance who, bizarrely, is actually named after a notorious murderer. He was born in December of 1963, and his two Christian names are Lee Harvey, which doesn't require much to work out that. Um, my, my question is for all the panel, but particularly um, for Dr. Callahan, who's probably got the most immediate experience. Um, a memorial that has a dual memorial function now, the war memorial at Enniskillen, do you find, what is the reaction, is, are there any differences in statements, omission of statements, body language 
between the two communities in relation to either the war memorial at Enniskillen in what it meant, say, the 1970s, and what it means now. Uh, and I'll leave you, you all to interpret that widely and in relation to other conflicts, and as you wish. Thank you. Thank you very much. And then behind two rows, there we go. Hello, I'm Heather, and um, I actually kind of had a question because um, I have a focus on East Asia, and a, one topic that comes up quite often is how, especially when it comes to Japan and memorializing, um, there are several conflicting issues. One issue that has come up fairly recently is um, the erection of comfort women statues. And um, that has caused a little bit of diplomatic tension between um, Japan and its neighbors, Japan asking them to take down these statues and some of these nations refusing to do so. Now, for, when it comes to the sake of diplomatic relations, is that a reason, a, any logical reason to say that these are people that should be forgotten just so that we can have better diplomatic ties. Mm. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. So we've got the question about the Statue of Unity in India and the question about multiple use of memorials and then the question about Japan and memorializing, which brings in this issue of, of um, diplomacy across borders. Uh, who wants to start us off? I could answer the Statue of Unity Fantastic. question, um, which I have a, an interest in, just for context so that people know what this is. It's currently the largest statue in the world, built in the state of Gujarat in western India by the current BJP Hindu right government. Um, the publicity for this statue is very interesting. If you look at the posters that accompanied the launch of the statue, which happened with much fanfare, it um, displays the height of the statue relative to the next major statue, which is in China, I think, and then uh, some others. And the Statue of Liberty is quite small. And the entire thrust of this publicity is basically to say ours is bigger than yours. So it's a, it's a gigantic sort of phallic project projecting Indian power in a historical moment where India desperately seeks recognition in the club of great powers, and this is the government's way of doing that. At, it should be said, enormous cost, um, economic uh, cost in terms of land. Uh, people have been displaced for this project. Uh, the kinds of people who have been displaced are the kinds of people who are always displaced, which is to say indigenous people, Adivasis. Um, and this adds insult to injury because the statue is built in the vicinity of a massive dam project that has also displaced waves of people over successive years. Um, I think one thing that this particular instance illustrates is that some exercises in statue building these days, or at any time, are, um, are manifestations of not so much decolonization as, as recolonization. And this is one example of that. It's a way of asserting dominance um, internationally as well as domestically. Um, so, so, so the agenda behind that statue is quite unambiguous. There are statue building projects in India that have a diametrically opposed agenda and are decolonizing projects. So members of subordinate castes in the Indian caste system, uh, Dalits and Bahujans, um, have built hundreds and thousands of statues of Ambedkar, uh, who is well known as the architect of the Indian constitution and is also the preeminent Dalit leader um, historically. So those, I would say, are uh, exercises in statue building that have a decolonizing agenda, right? And I think it's important to sort of put these two examples in conversation with each other because it shows us, I think, that uh, projects of statue building are, are, you know, have these multiple valences and agendas and have to be judged contextually in relation to who is doing them, who is being represented, and why. Um, picking up on that point about the name, um, 
I get married, I have a choice of changing my name or and kind of leaving behind that that legacy. I clearly chose to double barrel, barrel. Um, because for me it's a link to my past as well as to my future. Um, the, a name is, is such a strong um, aspect of our identity. It's one of the first things you learn as a child is how to write your name. Um, and so when we, we talk about the impact that a name could have, it's important to think, how how much of a connection does it have, but also what is done in that name. And there are people who have got kind of negative connotations in their names who then go on to to flip that, to, put, to make it something quite positive. Um, something else I wanted to pick up on, I'm no way as as, as gifted as the people on, my pa- on the panel. Um, however, when we talk about changing the meanings of memorials, they are always faced with resistance, every single time. And it is people who feel that they are losing something by that attempt to reframe it and we saw that with Road Must Fall the statue was still there in Oxford Oxford people who never noticed it was there were suddenly writing and going we must keep this statue do, 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 do. it's so important we must keep it, it's a symbol of and it's a case of the majority of Oxford people walked past it and didn't realise it was there because you look up for it. Most of us are going to the bus stop, which is next to it, or up the road. We're not thinking about what's, who's on these buildings around us. And so the, the arguments and the debates that came out of the resistance spoke volumes, not just to the people who were involved in the, in the campaign and in the struggle, but to the people who were watching it from the outside and the amazing people who came out of the woodwork to kind of add their argument. And the question is, is it just a statue? If it's not just a statue, we need to explore why it's not just a statue to certain people, because they, this resistance to change the meaning of something that represents such, and I, I use the word trauma a lot, and um, for different people there's different levels of it. For some people it's a social a community trauma, for some people it's an individual trauma. But for that symbol to represent that, and for other people to say, no, we must keep it, without trying to understand what it represents, means that that's where the resistance keeps coming from. And unless there's a political will to kind of push that conversation forward, it will constantly keep meeting that resistance, which is where we have to keep pushing it forward, but keep having these these conversations at all different levels, whether it's the local newspaper or whether it's internationally, that's where these conversations need to keep moving forward. The other thing I just wanted to pick up on is the internet is a powerful force and a powerful tool. Um, And even though people have now got that right to be forgotten, how much is anyone truly forgotten? And so when we talk about how things are remembered, actually the internet is now becoming the space where people go to be remembered, Um, whether that's for positive or for bad or for good or for negative. It's all that aspect of giving control to individuals to try and stamp their, their memory and to be remembered. And if we talk about the power of physical memorials, we can't really have that conversation without thinking about what's happening in the, in the internet on the World Wide Web and how are people having their memorials kind of recognised there as well. Um, one person asked a question about the Enniskillen bombing. Um, I'm not quite clear on what the question is, but I feel since it's been raised, I should say something about it. Uh, you know, the Enniskillen bombing took place in 1987. It was a bombing perpetrated by the IRA. It was at a Remembrance, November Remembrance Day Sunday, and uh, it sought to both efface the monument, I suppose, and also to kill people who were present. It was an appalling act. It had terrible outcomes, but it changed politics to some degree in Northern Ireland because people were so shocked and so horrified by it, uh, by the idea of actually placing a bomb while people were commemorating what for them was uh, an incredibly important event. I mean, I think you can see it as nothing other than an act of hate. Now, interestingly enough, I was in Enniskillen this year on the commemoration of the commemoration, which sounds kind of crazy, but, um, you know, it's become a kind of central uh, symbol, if you like, for 
a decision within, I suppose, a whole set of levels of nationalism, but also uh, for others. Uh, at the time, I think it kind of galvanised what we talk of now as the peace process. It changed the public atmosphere of politics. People were horrified by it. Nationalists in particular were horrified by it. And um, so, yeah, it, it, it probably led to what we call the peace process, but at the price of... Um, all of these deaths. It was quite interesting this year to go into the very beautiful little, uh, it's, a, it's a church rather than the cathedral, St. McCartan's in Enniskillen, to a Church of Ireland service that was recorded uh, and broadcast uh, by Irish television. And to see that... Um, to, to see people from both sides of the border, to see representatives from Dublin, to see Arlene Foster, Heather Humphreys, who's a minister uh, in Dublin. I, I mean, Enniskillen it was an awful event. It's also a kind of a symbol of hope. But I think it also it, it shows how, at a high political level, there is a desire for reconciliation. Uh, but... I was also struck, I am, as you may have noticed from my accent, from Dublin. Uh, you know, I'm not from a Northern Unionist tradition, but I was um, struck by the fact that most of the reads and most of the support for people on the day were from Ulster Unionists. So I have to say that although the horror of what happened in Enniskillen did bring people together in the past. The divisions within Northern Ireland are clearly inscribed by the fact that even though Southern government ministers, senior politicians, representatives from the Irish army wish to demonstrate a new solidarity on a ground level in the ground and the territory of Fermanagh around Enniskillen, I thought most of the wreaths I saw and most of the support I saw was from local unionists. So commemoration, I have to say, is highly divisive and most nationalists in Northern Ireland view commemorating uh, you know, the history of the British Army as something a lot of them don't wish to have any part in, nor were they included in, I suppose, for most of the 20th century, despite their participation in very large numbers in the First World War. So it's, it's, it's sorry, Enniskillen is very difficult, I think, to talk about. Thank you. So it would be interesting now to come back to this question that Michelle has touched on a little bit already, which is about when, if ever, memorials should be removed. So, Michelle, let's start with you and hear a little bit more about your thoughts on this issue. I think there's a difference between whether it's been removed to be forgotten or whether it's been removed to as a statement. And I think that's where I kind of keep coming back to political will. Um, because it's, and it's also about who's involved in that conversation to whether or not something should be removed. I think, as I said earlier, um, the removal doesn't necessarily remove the pain of what it symbolizes. And so I'm very much of that reframing, rephrasing the conversation around it um, because we might remove it. We might have the debate to remove it today, but 10 years down the line, the next generation might say, actually, that's something that we can rally around and that will will kind of move us forward. I kind of keep having the idea of, of the Planet of the Apes films where oh. you have, you know, the Empire State Build, sorry, the Statue of Liberty kind of half covered up by, by um, sand and kind of it's in the distance and nobody, you know, and for one person it means something, but for everybody else it's kind of, it's forgotten, but it's still there and it kind of gives something. Um, and I think that's the danger when we start talking about removing, um, I think there is a danger around it, especially when we talk about who's doing the removing. I think Rose, the Rose Must Fall campaign was very much about opening up the conversation. Mm -hmm. The statue was the, the, the kind of the the sledgehammer that was used to open the conversation, the statue is still there. The statue has now got protection around it, essentially. <laughs> um, however, the conversation keeps coming back to 
whether or not that should be removed. But also, actually, let's talk about the curriculum. Let's talk about representation. Let's talk about a lot of the issues in in Oxford University, but also in, in the education sector, around how we learn about our past and what our and what our history is. Mm. The statue may fall at some point in the future, but these conversations need to keep coming back to it. And it's amazing how you can repost or retweet part of that debate and that conversation, and all of a sudden those those conversations start again. The the um, the arguments, the debates, the discussions start again, which is why I say the use of the internet, kind of coming back to what was asked about Japan, I, I don't know very much about it, but actually the fact that it can be talked about online and that the conversation can be moved on and people can contribute to that discussion is something that we didn't have in, in the 70s, the 60s and the 80s, but actually could help with driving those conversations forward. So I think coming back to it, I think my argument is that I don't believe they should be removed, but I think it's very difficult to have that as a blanket statement across all memorials because it depends on who's involved in that conversation and what they symbolise to those people. Thank you so much. And Raoul, you've spoken interestingly about this distinction between removing something from its current place and, say, for example, moving it to a museum and removing it altogether and destroying it. Mm. So it'd be quite interesting to think about that. Yeah, just also picking up from where Michelle left off, um, some statues have fallen. So the road statue in Cape Town fell quite quickly. Uh, but interestingly, to pick up on, on what you were saying, uh, that protest quickly became one about fees. So that the hashtag that replaced it, or not replaced it, but, but in a way joined it, was fees must fall. Um, and many South African universities are having a conversation at the moment, as are we, uh, inspired by them, I should say, about the curriculum, about representation in the student body and faculty and so forth. When should a statue be removed? I think sometimes statues are very complicated and mean different things to different people. Sometimes I think statues are actually quite simple. I think Confederate statues in the United States are quite simple. Um, they were built to celebrate, commemorate, and glorify people who explicitly fought to defend the institution of slavery and did so proudly. All you have to do is to read the declarations of secession of the Confederate States in the United States during the Civil War, which say very clearly, we are fighting this war to defend the institution of slavery. Now, these are the generals and heroes that are commemorated in the Confederate statues that, by the way, weren't built at that time, were built 50 and 100 years later in other moments of white supremacist pushback against any kind of desegregation. So even in the 1920s and the 1950s and 60s, when these statues were being built, they meant the same thing that they meant in 1861. Um, and the reason that the right rallies around these statues, as it did in Charlottesville, is again the same reason that these statues were built and were popular in those earlier historical moments. This is why I think of these statues as actually quite simple. Um, what should be done with them? I think the museum idea is an interesting one. It prevents us from forgetting. Um, I, I do think statues can sometimes be recontextualized, but I do not think this is always possible. I think we also need to take the aesthetics of statues quite seriously. Many of these statues are explicitly built to glorify somebody, you know, resplendent on horseback on a high plinth, um, putting a little plaque that no one can read until, unless they go very close isn't really going to detract from the power of these symbols. Um, so I, I think aesthetics matter, and I think we should also be talking to sculptors and artists and thinking about uh, the aesthetics of representation and the political work that that does uh, when, when we have these conversations. Well, we know, for example, there aren't any statues of Adolf Hitler. No. So, I mean, there clearly is some kind of a consensus within the West that certain kinds of memorials are those we don't want to see. Mm -hmm. And nobody, I think, has particularly argued that, uh, you know, statues of Hitler should be kept in basements, you know. But then that's probably because he's so pervasive mm -hmm. an image within the culture and his image is recorded in so many other ways. I mean, I'm generally not in favour of destroying things if, because I think who knows what... 
I think they should be removed from the public sphere. Uh, the kind of statues you're talking about. Uh, on the other hand, they fulfil a function in the present of galvanising the alt-right. Uh, but generally, I would think politically, if at all possible, they should not be in the public sphere and they should be removed from it. Uh, I would have a preference for probably not destroying them, but keeping them somewhere for perhaps conversations in the future. But I, I don't really see... Uh, I suppose what also happens in certain situations, people destroy statues. Mm. People get rid of things themselves. Sorry, I mean, you know, it's not something one's supposed to say, but, <laughs> you know, I'm from a city where, you know, Nelson's Pillar overlooked the whole city of Dublin. Well, somebody took it upon themselves to blow it up in 1966. A lot of monuments that become repugnant to the eyes of populations get destroyed. I'm not saying it's a good thing. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. It happens if people are conscious of meaning in memorial objects and they dislike them, they, they, they will be removed. I mean, you just have to look at it in Belfast at the moment. On a, a local level, people erect commemorative small gardens, small objects in memory of you know, the local UVF or the local IRA and the quote-unquote other side keep coming and destroying them. So, you know, the, 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 that, that's a, another level of memorial. But it, it's not just in Ireland. It does go on elsewhere. But I, I think that um, Michelle's point about history and history teaching, uh, that the battle is almost... It's late in the day when you're talking about what you do with the statues. And I think you're right that history curriculums, not just in this country, but clearly in the United States, are vitally important. And, you know, people should be taught about their past and the past of others and the past of those over whom their ancestors had power if we're to have useful conversations in the present. I think it's also important to kind of say... That the most insulting thing to these people who have had these statues and things made in their name is to forget who they are. Um, and I kind of think, I walk through London, I walk through New York, and I see all these statues to all these old white men who are dead and long gone, who I have no idea who they are, and I'm not even going to go onto the internet to research and find out who they are. And so for me, that's my own kind of little way of resistance, is saying, you are forgotten. You aren't here anymore. I am here. And so... You know, for me, it's that idea that we there are other ways to kind of to kind of remove the the, the prevalence of the statues without necessarily pulling them down. However, a number of these statues, because of who they symbolise, you know, there's not enough women, there's not enough uh, people who represent the work that they've done for LGBT communities. There's definitely not enough people of of of. Black, who are black or of African origin or Asian origin or Arabic origin, you know, there's not enough representation of the people who are here. And the question is then, if we talk about all the statues, is what are they trying to do? Because from a political aspect, I'm going to be honest, you know, the political aspect is dominated by white men, white straight white men. And so to have these statues around, kind of coming back to this symbol in India, which has kind of got this phallic symbolization, the question is why are they so prominent and why do they, are, met, are they met with so much resistance when you try to take them down? Is that something about our gender conversations, about our representation of, of people from the black communities? Is it about our representations of the kind of the collective minorities who technically are the dominant? And who are they trying to keep build up? Who are they trying to fill with a sense of importance? Because it's definitely not me. Um, and as you know, a black woman walking around, I don't look in awe at these statues of old men on you know who are towering above me and go, I really wish I could be you or be on the horse. Um, I kind of just <laughs> think, no, that's not that's not my narrative. And I've got other I've got other struggles <laughs> that I need to fight um, because it's not. It's not filling me with kind of that, that sense of I've got the biggest one kind of thing. It's more a case of that statue is just for somebody who had to do that to make themselves feel important and significant. Wonderful. Thank you. So, again, let's come back to you. If anybody has a question, raise your hand. There's a roving mic, remember, so wait. And I'm going to take the person with the purple scarf. 
purple scarf there. This person. Stick your hand in the air. Yeah, there you are. Yeah, sorry. There we go. And then behind with the glasses, wave your hand. Yeah, that person. And then we'll take one down here at the front. Hi, uh, thank you. Um, my question is not directly connected to this part of the conversation, but um, it was kind of raised by uh, Dr. Margaret O'Callaghan before. Um, so what I find interesting is how memorials in public space are being perceived and to what an extent are they, do they, be, do they um, develop a momentum of, of their own? How do they... Um, take a life on their own so is it so the initial the initial um, purpose for why they were constructed does it change over time in the public's perception so I find the um, the topic of the red poppy very interesting and um, there was the question of um, why did the poppy popu popularity grow or grew in the past um, is it is it like uh, in today's time, is it more about wearing the poppy or not wearing the poppy, or is it is there a real, not a real reason, but like um, is it still about the initial memorial artifact of the red poppy, or is that more a so social movement of its own and people just stick it on their uh, coat and that's it? Um, yeah, I don't know whether that was a coherent question, but <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. And that, yeah. Oh. Yeah, I mean, um, it's just uh, some comments, just picking up from what Michelle um, was saying, really, about um, as a black woman, um, I will, how I would say I would see myself as a living memorial um, in terms of the of black community, uh, Afro-Caribbean, um, as a descendant, really, of the uh, at least 20 million people who were forcibly transported, you know, um, across the Atlantic. Um, Let's say stolen. Let's so, use the language. They, it, people were stolen from their lands. Yeah. Stolen, um, yeah, and forcibly removed. You could say that's a kind of memorializing in, 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 in a sense. And, you know, why don't we have a black uh, Holocaust memorial as such? You know, why isn't there? That's, I suppose that's my question. Why isn't there a black memorial, a black um, Holocaust um, yeah, I mean, there's the, recently the Commonwealth um, statue, I think it's about a couple of years now, which is uh, more for the contribution of um, black and ethnic minorities who took part in the First and Second World War. Um, what I would say is that there, there always seems to be almost a struggle to get that recognition. You know, I mean, this is over a hundred years and yet as you know this is just in the last couple of years we've had a memorial um, in terms of the Commonwealth you know and so why is there this this slow um, kind of process in terms of remembering you know the huge um, contribution um, that, that we have made um, you could argue that the city you know over 400 years all the wealth that came from uh, the slave trade is a memorial, the city itself, you know, and, and the buildings, many of which, you know, were built from slave money. So again, you know, um, it's all around us, really, you know, um, that's, what I, that's what I would argue. Um, and also, I would think of the institutions as, um, how can I say it now, institutional racism, you could say, is a form of memorializing those very, the very, um, the very city and the very uh, ongoing kind of oppressive, uh, oppressive um, systematic um, aspects, you know, of, of, um, of our people. So it's there, that in, in a sense, the memorialization is there, but at the same time, you know, why isn't there something very, very physical, something very public, something very, you know, you'd expect that there would be something, you know, that, that, that would just be something that you couldn't just pass, you couldn't just walk past and say, well, actually, you know, we're not going to remember, you know, we, it would, why isn't there something that's actually making us remember, you know, every day so that we never, um, this is, doesn't go on. And I think that the reason I would say that trafficking uh, as, as, as a legacy of the slave trade is, is going on is because we do not have that 
uh, memorialization. We do not have something to say. Let's keep remembering. Thank you very much. And yes, I'm concerned about memorials being removed. Um, I'm a supporter of road peace, and some of our members have set up shrines and roadside memorials where there's been a, a fatal crash. Um, and some people find this a, an important outlet for their grief. Now, the problem is that in some parts of Britain, these have been deliberately removed by local councils their argument being that these can distract the motorists, that also motorists don't want to be reminded of death on the roads. And this causes great distress to people who've, whose loved ones have been killed in car crashes. And I think that's a good example of what happens when memorials are removed. Yeah, three really interesting questions then. We'll try and make time at the end for a last round. So we're, we've got 10 minutes left. If we could have a quick response to um, these questions, and then we'll come back and try and have another go. If I could just say one thing in response to the last woman who spoke. Maybe one of the reasons why there is not the memorialising of the experience as articulated by you, is because the society is too racist to do it, because there are too many vested interests whose wealth were made, you know. In other words, it's not an accident. It's, it, it is, it's highly political actuality in the present that the society is, not just this society, but most Western societies are too racist to recognize the scale of what was done in relation to huge swathes of the population of Africa. It's just too big for people to wish to stare at, acknowledge and memorialize. So I suppose all you can do, or all one can do, is slowly attempt mm -hmm. to challenge the racism of a society that would seek to deny that historical experience. And I'd probably add to that and say it's still painful because there are people who are still benefit, be, benefiting from it. They're still profiting from it. Um, and so why would you hold up a mirror to something that is still ongoing where it would mean that there would need to be change? This is the reason why I went into education, because we have to start with the education of the young people. And unless there are the teachers in the room who are able to facilitate those conversations, even in a small way that young people can then take it forward, then that conversation is not going to happen. And we all know, and I'm not going to get into my other hobby horse, which is about education and recruitment and retention and why teachers are leaving the classroom, but actually it is the black teachers who are leaving because of the institutionalized racism. And so they aren't even able, when they are in that space, to keep that space open for the conversations to happen. And so then it comes back to how much of this is systematic, because if people don't learn about what the issues are, really the issues are, then they're not going to challenge them. And so in, if our young people aren't learning about the history, their history, and especially for young black children who are constantly told the only part that we play in history is that we were slaves. That's it. We don't learn about um, Haiti. We don't learn about, the, you know, we don't learn about the civilizations of Africa that existed for millennia. We don't learn about that. We don't learn about the positive contributions. We don't learn about the fact that the traffic lights. We don't learn about all of the contributions that black people have, have made, the positives, we learn about our victimhood. And that's an aspect of kind of that systematic keeping us in, keeping us in our place. The battle to create a statue, and talking about memorialization, the statue for Mary Seacole, the battle that that is still going on to today, where it's just getting some funding, it's getting the space, it's getting the support for it, and that is a fight to get a statue of a black woman. And yet we can create a statue for... To, you know, Donald Trump's going to have a statue because he'll, he'll fund it. You know, it's like, it's, when you talk about the, the communities making something that's important to them, where is the political will? Because when we talk about removing a statue, there's a lot of resistance. But when we talk about creating a statue, oh my, it depends on who, who's being memorialized. So I think education absolutely is the key. And um, it's a battle. It is an absolute battle because the curricula is so narrow. But that's because it's an element of trying to control what people learn about. And that's why I just want to say that's not just for the black community. That's for all of us. We all have to learn the history of, of the true history of our peoples and how we've ended up here where we are today. 
Um, and just building on that, the, there is a new African American museum in Washington D.C. Uh, it's the newest of the Smithsonian museums, and it's it's a really brilliant initiative, and I would highly recommend that you all visit it. On when you leave the museum, on the wall at the exit, there's a big sign. Um, it's a it's a it's a quote, and I'm afraid I can't remember who it's attributed to, but it says something like. If the problem of the 20th century was the color line, the problem of the 21st century is color blindness. So just picking up on what you were saying, Margaret, not only do we live in racist societies, but we live in societies that pride themselves on being beyond racism, yeah. as if uh, this has all been left behind, um, in a sense. Um, I, I would just want to say something about empire, because it's come up and yeah. we haven't really talked about it, and we are in Britain and London. Um, I think people do talk about empire, but unfortunately many people in the public sphere do it in, in, in a completely shocking way. And I've been quite struck by how empire has come up in the context of Brexit, uh, particularly when Brexit your MPs uh, speak fondly about the trade deals that they will strike with the erstwhile white dominions of the, of the <laughs> Commonwealth. Interestingly, those are the countries that tend to be named. Um, and also, uh, following the, the last Olympics, uh, a conservative MP tweeted a medal tally organized in this bizarre fashion, British Empire, Europe, and rest of the world, or something like that. There is a kind of... It boggles my mind that there is this fond remembrance of the empire, which is utterly not reciprocated in the territories that were formerly part of that empire. So there is this weird conversation and recognition of empire that is happening and that keeps sort of resurfacing. But something about it is, you know, the last gasp of a dying thing that just refuses to die. And I think we need to, we need to kill that in some sense. I think it's growing. Yeah. Definitely. And I think actually the Windrush um, debacle that is still ongoing, just because it's not in the, in, the, in the media anymore doesn't mean it's not still ongoing. We've still got people who were part of the empire or colonialization who were told to come to Britain, who are now, who were basically kicked out um, and are now refused the opportunity to come home. And I think the Windrush just really does symbolize how important the discussion, and I use the word empire and colonialization, it's kind of, it's the kind of the two sides of the same <coughs> Point, I think that is the reason why we've, we've kind of ended up here. It's that reminder that we didn't learn about our past to understand our future. And I think that really is a huge symbol that's got lost in the whole Brexit debate. And I think Raul was absolutely right that Brexit is that kind of this harping back to the old version of colonialization and this idea that life was better before Europe because of that colonial discussion that is, that is still rumbling. Okay, so I'm going to try and squeeze in two last questions. If you can keep the questions very short, and then we'll come back to the panel for um, last words. So we've got one here right at the front. Wait for the microphone. And then person with the... Sorry? sorry? Oh, okay. And then the person with the glasses. Can you put your hand up so they can... Yeah, okay. Well, um, I'm thinking all memorials are not too nasty white men on horses and that a few years ago the BFI was showing some very early films of London and from an, an early omnibus I think in 1904 1903 that was going through the streets and going up past Trafalgar Square and up St. Martin's Lane and I thought nothing's changed nothing's changed and then I realized the statue of Edith Cavell wasn't there because none of that had happened and that statue of that woman, that brave woman, she, I think she deserves to be memorialized and she deserves to be remembered. And so when we're talking about memorials, we need to remember that some of them are valid. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Um, firstly, thank you very much for an really interesting talk. So I'm looking at the new Holocaust Memorial in London specifically. And my question is, there's been a lot of discussion about whether the money should be put into education instead. Um, do you think we run the risk of kind of not keeping those conversations going by putting something in stone and spending the money on a memorial in one location? And would the money be better spent in education for people in the whole country, not somewhere where a lot of people won't actually ever visit? Or is there still value to be had in putting something into stone? Mm. Yeah, 
Two very interesting questions. So I'll come back to the panel now for final words to address these questions or to pick up on something you desperately wanted to say but haven't yet. <laughs> I'll start with Margaret. I just didn't answer. Somebody who asked me a question in the last round about the red poppies and why there's such an increase. Well, I, I mean, I, I think there is an intimate connection between the nature of what's commemorated at a particular time, but it's complex. So therefore, I do think the growth in public of the importance of the poppy in Britain probably says something about military involvement over the last 10 or 20 years, because the poppy doesn't just commemorate the First and Second World Wars, it does commemorate British forces in the present. It's, it could be, it, it may relate slightly to Belair's, what was his, Cool Britannia, but it's, it's, it's also part of a kind of conservative, quasi-austerity politics. I mean, I think, I, I think it would be quite an interesting question around which to attempt to analyse particular changes in British society over the past 20 or 25 years. But unfortunately, I don't have a simple answer. <laughs> I'd love to pick up on the discussion of the poppy and about the roadside, um, the roadside memorials as well, because I think it's all part of a bigger conversation and about what is valued within a society and kind of what's used to keep people in line as well. That kind of you must value this rather than that, and that's and so. I think there's a, huge, a bigger conversation there, but I think the point I want to kind of harp back to is about education, because it's all well and good saying education should include this and should include that, but unless the, the structure is there to support the teachers to actually create those conversations, and with, we talk about political will, but there's also political interference in education, where education becomes something that, again, adds to what is valued and what is important from somebody's perspective, you know, the current government very much are um, this this kind of grammar school private school kind of um, the classics kind of educated um, approach that is trickled down into our education where empire and colonialization is not going to be discussed and created have a space created for because it holds up that mirror to what they're trying to teach our young people for in, children in inner city areas you know learning about particular types of, of classical writing is not something that they value. It's not something that's important to them. But when it comes to talking about education, we have to, I think that's a bigger conversation about what do we want to be educated about and how we're going to prepare the next generation to make a better impact on the world that we are in today because we're talking about a globalised a globalized community now um, and if our young people aren't able to have those conversations and aren't able to explore it, then we're stuck making those same mistakes again and having these same conversations in 20, 50, 100 years' time. Okay, we're almost, almost out of time, so over to you to lead, to lead us to the final word on memorials. In response to the question about whether the statue should be built or money spent on education, I can't answer that question because it depends on what one's priorities are, but it does make me wonder why do statues keep being built? Mm. And I think that is because... Statues do not ask for your permission. You can avoid picking up a book. You can prevent yourself from walking into a cinema or a museum. But you cannot say no to a statue. It just happens upon you when you walk in public space. It does not ask for your consent. And that is why statues are so incredibly powerful. And that's why I think they will keep being built. Wow. Well, tonight will be memorialized forever in podcast form. Do check it out. Thank you so much to our panel for these wonderful insights and to you for your great questions. Thank you. Thank you.